talk about today is try to, to move the, the context from UK to Scandinavia and talk a little bit about population structure and migratory patterns. Um, so I will talk a little bit about sea trout abundance, focusing on Sweden, but also talk a little bit about Norway and Denmark. Also mention a little bit about population structure. We have done some genetic works. Main focus will probably be on migratory patterns and uh, mortality rates on the outward migration. And I will also talk a little about the various approaches we have to model abundance. And then I will also <coughs> give a plug for the ISIS working group Vigo Trusta to end with. But since it an, it's an early start, I thought it could be nice to start with some, some nice pictures of our small streams on the coastline of Sweden. So this is a couple of pictures that shows how it looks in the sea trout streams on the western coast of Sweden. So as you can see, they are very, very small. And most of the streams doesn't produce fishing opportunities for, for sport fishermen. This is mainly juvenile habitats, but they are very, very productive. And as you can see, the influence of riparian zone is really, really crucial here. That is really what triggers the productivity in these streams. So you get to long for the summer when you see these pictures. Just in a few months time, this will start to grow. So this is really great. So this, all these streams is within one hour of traveling from, from Gothenburg, where I'm positioned. So it's very neat to have these field sites in the nearby region. So this is what we consider a good habitat, with a lot of material from the riparian zone falling into the stream, a lot of breeze blocks, a good of habitat both for juvenile spawning areas and also for juvenile holding position places. This then, we need to figure out how do we monitor abundance in these streams then. Um, this stream on the left is actually the same stream in high flood and low flood. So the stream really changes. So it, of course, then makes it dramatically different if you want to go electrofishing in different opportunities here. All these streams feed enormous amount of sea trout, and the sea trout is now the main target for sport fishermen along the coastline. So this is really crucial that we try to monitor it. So this is popular sport fishermen. Uh, the main way we do abundance for sea trout in Sweden is by electrofishing. We have covered almost all of Sweden in electrofishing localities since the 70s. So we have a quite unique data set here. <coughs> in total, there is approximately 800 sea trout streams in Sweden, and they're all dominated by these fairly small streams. On the east coast, we have some larger streams where they stock hatchery trout to improve the, the, the stocks. But on the west coast, where I'm positioned, it's only naturally produced sea trout. <clears throat> so, if we then look at, based on this electrofishing data, what have this given us and what, how has the development been? So, this here is the average amount of trout, zero plus fish, abundance of sea trout power, and this is the deviation from that average. So, if the figure is above that line, it was better before, and if it's above, than it was worse before. So you see a trend line here coming from 95 to 2014. And also since Sweden is a very tall country, it's big uh, difference in the climate. So up north, we have an average temperature of minus two to, to two, and south, seven to eight degrees, the sort of yearly average. So we need to divide that up. So what that gives us is that we have a development in sea trout power population that's <coughs> positive in the north, but unfortunately seem to be negative in the south. And that was a little bit worrying because we really don't know what that means and why that is the case. But if we then start to look at the recruitment of different year classes, we can see this is only then from the west coast, that we have a steady recruitment of zero plus fish. Older than zero plus fish seems to be decreasing. But on the other hand, the size of the zero class fish is increasing and the smalls seem to be decreasing in size. So this seems to be sort of a familiar story, but then we heard that several times yesterday. So what we expect here as well is that we see an earlier small drum. And we have some data to support this as well. This is from Högvarsson, just south of Gothenburg. 
And the open circles here are older trout, and the black bars are young of the year trout. And we can see that we have a steady recruitment of young of the year trout, a decline actually in the older trout, but at the same time, we have an increase in the amount of smolt that leaves the system. So this gives us also a suggestion that we probably have a larger proportion of one plus smolt that leaves the system. So hopefully then that means that we still can keep the fishermen in the sea happy. <coughs> but we don't sure really. We need to sort of consider and follow this up. So what would really happen? We have an increased growth. We know that. The increased growth will make the par larger. It seems to be as the smolts will be smaller and more. We don't know really what are the possible consequences of this in the long run. So this is something that we need to both monitor and modeling. There might be that we have high survival and growth of this fish. <coughs> Could be that they return earlier as a zero winter fish. Could also change the survival and competition. So there's all different scenarios that we really don't need to know what will happen. So this is crucial that we try to follow. Um, so just some quick words about the situation in Denmark. Um, here there is an average of about 400 sea trout streams, so there's still a lot of sea trout streams here as well. The density of zero plus trout has increased, um, although there is a larger regional difference here. But this is the overall small productivity, and it's estimated to be 600,000 small produced here. Norway, unfortunately, has uh, very, very little assessment going on, and they started much later than what we have done. They have approximately more than 1,100 streams with sea trout, so maybe, maybe they have so many that they think that it would be enough. But unfortunately, the catches has really declined. So in, in the rivers with permanent fishing, the, has been a decline by almost up to three quarters in some areas. So, so that's a big concern as well. Right, so now I'll move a little bit on to the population structure. All these streams in Sweden, they are assumed to be more or less genetic uh, unique, but it hasn't really validated. So we wanted to see to what extent do the fish really return to their home river to spawn. So to do that, we did a genetic differentiation using single nucleotide polymorphism, SNPs, as a tool. So we collected 500 fish from 22 different fish. And this was spawning fish, so we knew that they were returning to the rivers to spawn. And we did sport fishing samples and 64 fish, sport fishing angling caught fish. So this is the coastline, and this is the number of streams that we work on. Um, <clears throat> and the suggested population structure here that Surprisingly, there wasn't 22 different genetic strains. It seemed to be clustered into mainly four main structures. We had one northern group, we had one southern group, and one central orientated group. So this suggests that the sea trout in this region are probably not adapted to their home local river, but whereas more likely in fjord areas or larger systems. And that could also explain why it's so easy to restore these kind of habitats. It can have been shut down for, for decades, but the moment you open up a barrier, you have sea trout spawning the same autumn. So the straying is probably quite large in this system. <clears throat> um, just a word about this Sauron, which seems to be special in a way that it is attributed to one of the largest streams, and it seems to depend on completely differently. So the take home message here is that the local adaptation seems to be fjord areas. <clears throat> And this is the trout from the river Sauron. And if I would show you this picture, you would of course say that this is a female and this is a male. But that's not the case. This is two females. And clearly, this fellow here is this group here. So that's completely genetic different from the rest of the trout here. So this is something that we want to look into. And they spawn in tributaries to the largest river we have. So may, may, maybe they don't go out to the, into the sea at all. We don't know, but this is something we want to follow up on. Right, so where do the fish go then? What is the migratory patterns? Uh, we've done, done some studies on this using hydroacoustics, pit tags, and data storage tags. Try to sort this out. Um, the study area, again, on the west coast of Sweden. Two systems. Uh, just around the area of Gothenburg, 
be Fjorden just north and Himlån just south. Um, starting with the largest experiment we'll be doing for two years, um, using Himlån as a fairly large river. And the first thing we wanted to do is to investigate the triggers. What is the triggers for out-migrating fish? And also how much fish is actually produced on the outward migration here. So for that purpose, we had a small trap um, for two years. And we emptied it every day to see when did the fish go. Um, and then we had a number of uh, logging stations. This is the picture where you just saw from the river, a couple of receivers here using the MCO system, and then it's a big estuary here where cormorants, Niels's bird, is occupying, and also a number of receiver rows in the coastline here. So we could follow them on the outward migration here. Um, so the triggers then seem to be both discharge and temperature. And this shows really that it's crucial to, to repeat an experiment during two years because the results were quite different between the years. Um, in 2011 was a very unique year in the sense that it never rained. The temperature just increased and the, there was never any peak in discharges. And of course, that forced the fish to move. So around 10 degrees, this is the discharge, as you can see, the discharge just dropped. But approximately around 10 degrees, then the fish started to migrate anyway. So they had to leave the system. In 2012, then, was a more normal year. And you can see at every peak of discharge, here is one, there is one, there is one. You have also a peak in the out migration. So clearly, the triggers for out migration differed between the years. It seems to be that discharge is probably the main driver, but when you come up to 10 degrees, too costly to stay behind, and then you need to get going. Uh, we could also see that the temperature increased the proportion of day migrants. So at the temperature of 10 degrees, this is the proportion of night migrants, but above 10 degrees, you have a larger proportion that start to move all the day around. So that could also be costly in a way. So the take home message. For this, I think that when we see that our streams get increasingly fragmented, it could alter the discharge and also the temperature. So it could also change the triggers we see for outward migration. So we need to bear that in mind. Uh, we could also see, which I don't think has been reported before, that during this outward migration, salmon and trout were quite often using shoals of roach to migrate in, to sort of probably avoid being eaten. So quite often seen in these shows. So then we continue to follow them on their outward migration using these acoustic transmitters. And as I mentioned, there was a huge difference in the discharge between the years. And that also was reflected in the difference in mortality. At the year with low discharge, we had the mortality rates of smolts for 51% and kelts and 30%. And in normal discharge, <coughs> the mortality rate was down to 26% or 5% for Celts. So twice as much increase in mortality with low discharge event. So clearly that's something that we need to bear in mind when we try to model the mortality rate, that it can vary to a large extent, really. Uh, then we follow them along the coastline further out, and we could see that it's mainly, this is from the inland shore and to the outer coastline. And this is clockwise activity. So mainly nocturnal migration on the migration route towards the coast, outer coastline. But when they are on the outer coastline, they seem to be feeding more happily around the hours. We don't know what they're doing, but we interpret it as they probably start to feed in this region and they are just out migrating to feed in this region. <clears throat> we could also see that the migration seemed to occur in two clusters. So they don't migrate, even if there was a discharge event forcing the fish to get away, they seem to be holding back some of the population. So what I'm going to show you now is a small animation. So this is a sketch of the, uh, of the, of the area. This is the receiver station in the stream. This is the estuary. And this is the receiver line on the coastline. And each dot you will see will be an individual fish moving outwards of this region. And 
and the animation isn't 100%. They don't move over the island. They go, of course, they go around the island. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I want you to see is that some fish really stay behind for quite a while, and some fish just disappear straight out of the coastline. So it seemed to be two main clusters. One fast lever goes quick out of the system, and one that stays behind and use, utilizes the stream to larger extent, and also stays in the estuary for a longer period. So that's what this figure shows, that you have these two main clusters. Um, so that will be the take home message for that telemetry, that you have an, two types of migratory clusters, one that goes very quick and one that stays behind, and also that you mainly have nocturnal migration in the, in the river system. Uh, we did a similar thing up in Uddevalla, which is north of Gothenburg, where we have two rivers coming out of the system, and we try to follow them on the coastline here. This system is very different. The further study was doing where we have a very, very shallow water, and you just you're here, the fish has to enter immediately into quite deep water. So this is a fjord area. So we would expect that the mortality rate would be slightly lower here. Um, again, we saw the same pattern on migratory clusters, that when you had an increase in discharge, a lot of fish left, but not all. This is April and this is May. So again, you see fish leaving at a discharge event, but not everyone. So two different clusters. Um, and the early one also seemed to be staying longer in the inner fjord. And the one that migrated earlier also seemed to disappear out of the fjord earlier. Probably sort of more prolonged migration on the coastline, which we don't know. Uh, so this is just to give you an idea about the survival rates. They were generally high in streams. There were no difference between the survival rates. Uh, so usually around 80% in one of the streams and 70% in the other stream. So it's a fairly good survival rate still. Uh, and this figure is just to show you that most of the fish turned the northern direction and some went in the southern direction. Uh, the different colors here just refers to the different streams here. So we could follow them on the outward migration. But still, we only could follow them to this spot and then they were lost for us. So we also had done some, some work on data storage tags where we tried to see what kind of depth are they using and how much time do they actually spend in, in, in the sea and do they go up and, up and down. So for that purpose, we tagged adult individuals using these data storage tags. We tagged them in the stream. And then the idea was to, to let them go out into the ocean, and then we should hopefully recapture them the following year in the stream again. Of course, this was a high-risk project, because we, we need to get all this back. Um, so we got a number of, of fish back. So you can clearly see here that you have a number of events where they, where they dive down to 8 meters, to 10 meters, but most of the time they are sort of surface feeders. So it gives us some idea. For out of these 22 fish, I think we have recovered six at the moment. None in the stream, unfortunately. They've all been recaptured by fish walking, by people walking their dogs, finding these pieces on the shore. Uh, most of the fish has ended up in this way. Uh, I don't know if you can follow the pattern here, but this is the, t uh, the temperature that drops to this level, and then it increases to 40 degrees. Uh, yeah. You just mentioned it, yeah. So five out of these six tags were ended up in that way. Right. Has anybody got the time, so I'm not talking too much? Uh, Are you okay? I'm okay. Good. So now I want to go end up with a sort of uh, some little bit of talk about how do we use this electrofishing data to assess the small production. So we have this huge amount of electrofishing data, and there is also quite a lot of habitat surveys by the county boards done in Sweden. So we try to merge this technique to sort of model small production. So what we need then is we need some sort of quantitative habitat classification. We need electrofishing at representative habitats. We need to assess mortality, degree of multiplication, migration mortality and winter mortality, and also some sort of region-specific data. Since Sweden is a very tall country, we can't use just one data. We need to have region-specific data that differ from the southern region to the northern region. <clears throat> so this is one way that we can sort of model our abundance, that we have 
electrofishing, we calculate an age structure, we assess the habitat class, and then we estimate all these parameters, biotope mapping, winter survival, and all other factors like chemical and physical parameters. So it can get quite complicated, but in the out flow here, we should have sort of a calculated small production. And this has been done in some streams where we try to, to validate and test this model. So I will just guide you through some, some examples here. So what we've been doing, we've been division up the stream in a number of categories that gives us an idea about how suitable all this habitat for, for trout. And that goes from class zero that's unsuitable to class three that is a good, very good habitat with good substrate, velocity, shade, and complexity. So that gives us sort of the top score. Um, and then we have region-specific average densities for within each of these habitat categories. So this is, for example, in Vettern region in the middle part of Sweden, habitat class three zero plus fish should hold 97.3 zero plus fish per, square, per, per hundred meters. So that's sort of the average that we use. And then if we extrapolate on this, I know we know that this should be 100%, and then in habitat one, we should have 57% out of that number. So we can then use this data to extrapolate for different habitats. So that could be a way of sort of modeling it. So then we walk through the whole stream and we do a definition of stretches and we do habitat scoring and then we have electrofishing at some representative sites. So that means that we don't need to have data on all of these categories. We can then just extrapolate it if we know to some extent where, where the qualities are and what, what are the numbers in some of these categories. So this is one example that we've been walking in the stream and categorize this is a good habitat, three, two, three. And then you get uh, an idea about the distribution. This is an example of class three. This is sort of the top ranked habitat. So this was definitely be scored as class three. And on top of this, then we add electrofishing mm -hmm. then at the representative habitats. We need to add winter mortality, degree of smaltification, migration mortality. And as you can see, in the, the poorest habitat, we have a mortality rate of up to 17%. In the best habitat, between zero and five percent, but then we need to add this, this fellow as well, the lake mortality, and that can, in some data, it has been supported up to 75 percent. So it gets quite complicated, but we need to, to, to add the lakes as well. So there's a number of literature data, but there's much more data that we need to put into here. So clearly Sweden has four index rivers and three with small trap in Norway, so we need to, to see if we can use this small trap to, to validate the system. Um, and in River Avon, on the east coast of Sweden, this small production has been quantified in eight years. The average deviation from those predicted was 16%, which is pretty good over a period of five years. Uh, but if I told you the story in the rest three years, it's a little bit less. So it's between 90 and 360% in the remaining three years. So it's a huge variation there, of course. But still, in the old run, you could probably see that there is a trend that it should, could work, sort of prioritizing tool, and to some extent at least. It has also been validated in Chevlung, and the accuracy here was between plus minus 25%. So it's not sort of a rocket science tool, but it gives us an idea, and when we want to start to prioritizing where we should do a restoration effort, that can give us a guideline here at least. Um, you can also have a simpler model where we just base the system of a number of fixed percentage of its density, and then has a mortality potential of this. And that's been done in Himlon, where the migration mortality probably is higher. Uh, here we added production from 30% abundance of the zero plus fish. And then we add a mortality rate, and this resulted in an overestimation between 18 and 90%. So it's still acceptable, I would say. It's not sort of really, really that good, but uh, when we sort of try to improve the data we put into, I think that we can even get better results here. Right, um, so I would try to just sum up a little bit with some clear conclusion. Um, I think that we need to say that the sea trout stock in Scandinavia needs a more standardized assessment. It's very sort of vague and diverse at the moment. Um, the development of stocks is positive probably in Sweden and Denmark, but more vague and questionable in Norway due to the catches, this might be a bit threatened. 
genetic clusters that we found suggest that we have a large degree of strayers. We probably still see homing, but the data suggests that at least 10% ought to be straying. The triggers for auto migration seems to be both discharge and temperature. Migration is mainly nocturnal, and mortality can indeed be substantial, especially in years at low discharge when the trout has to go through estuaries. Temperature might also change the timing of migration. Bio reference point is missing to a large extent, and we need to add them along this north-south gradient in Sweden, and also going further down in Europe. Stock assessment based on this habitat mapping is possible, I would say, but we need to have longer time series. An alternative simple model needs to be developed and evaluated, so that's what we start to work on at the moment. Um, parameters such as winter mortality and migration costs needs to be further validated and tested in different systems. An accurate model will help us to manage a system. I think I've shown you now that the model work to, to some extent. It won't give us the exact number, but will help us to prioritize our activities. And it could also help us to maybe highlight and know exactly what would be the effect of various kinds of restoration activities. So this is some examples of sort of habitat restoration. So if we know then the effect of improving the gravel bed or improving the structure for large fish, then we could hopefully get an idea of what would happen for the small productivity. So that's done in both small and large scales. <clears throat> right. So the take home message is there that the habitat modeling can act as a guide on which sections to restore and a little bit on how. Right, so that was the last slide. And then I just want to acknowledge uh, a number of people that are working with this. This is Anton Haldén and Niklas from Jörgen for Fiskeri i And also David Alvén, who's been my PhD student. He's been done most of the work regarding migration. Um, so before I start, I would also like to do a small, small plug for, for this part here. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Uh, so in your in your package, there is a leaflet with some information for this working group. And, and there's been two working, working um, workshops on, salmon, no, sorry, on sea trout. Uh, and the last workshop suggested that we need to get going with the working group with the overall aim to develop these assessment models and also establish payload reference point for sea trout. And we all heard a lot about the complexity of the CETRA, so this can be tricky. Uh, but ISIS has accepted the proposal, so now this working group has started. Uh, so it will be chaired by me and Alan Walker. And we will have the first meeting on the 24th to 26th of April in Gothenburg. And I also want to highlight that this is not a workshop, there will be a working group. So this will be a starting point. And then they will run over three years. Um, and the overall aim is really to try to develop these models and also to provide a database. So the first thing we want you to think about carefully is first, of course, you're more than welcome to join us in Gothenburg. But if you can't join us, please think about, sorry? Let's have data, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Data, yeah. Data wanted, yes, because I know that talk to people here and you have provided important data. So I think one of the ideas with this working group is to, to provide a database on data such as juvenile densities, habitat characteristics, abundance of spawners, outmigrating smolts. And the idea is to give this in a transparent database so we all can access it and start to work on different approaches and model it. So we will, of course, think about how to access it, but the idea is that even if you not join us in this working group, you will still have access to this data and try to sort of get a transparent use of it. So I think that will be neat. Right, thank you very much for your attention.